ahead and get into the announcements. And um, Pastor Ricky is not coming tonight. Uh, he and Pastor Annette are super overwhelmed with getting ready for Sri Lanka. So he is there getting some things done with Pastor Annette for tonight. So, um, but Pastor James is bringing us a word. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Because he just shared with no, he just shared with me a little bit, and I know that once you know, you can never unknow. So there's some things that he's bringing that I was like, I don't want to hear it because you're responsible. Once you can, once you know, once it, once you know that it's supposed to change your heart, and you don't have an excuse anymore, it jacks you up. No, I am a repeat. A vendor, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, past, no Pastor Ricky tonight, but you do get Pastor James. Next week you get me. And I'm preaching about, you ready? We need a Judas in our life as well as Jesus did. That, that messed me up. So, um... Just a little bit that God has been showing me about, I know. What was the purpose of Judas being in Jesus' life? Well, you know, it had to fulfill prophecy. So what's, what's over us that we need to get over to get to what's been prophesied over us? To get us to the cross, absolutely. You don't get to bypass the cross. Anyways, we have a new class Sunday. It is called Christ our righteousness. Okay, this is um, uh, another one of uh, Pastor Rob's classes. So I am taking a little bit more time um, myself to make sure that I can convey it um, from the things that he's laid out, but also in a way that, because the only way you can really teach something is if when you believe it. And I need it to be a part of me in order to convey it the way that it's supposed to be. So um, uh, April 23rd is our barbecue cook-off. Um, Norm has a list on the back. If you're going to be at the luncheon, please put your name down. Let him know what you're bringing. If you want to be a part of the brisket cook-off, just bring it. Don't put your name on it. We'll, label, we'll give them all a number, and then we're going to test them. And we'll see who wins. Because right now it's just, again, it's Robbie and James. So, I don't know. <laughs> He's going to be quiet. He's going to be quiet. So, anyways, if you're, going, if you're coming, please sign up so that way we, uh, Norm knows exactly um, what we're bringing. Okay? So, I'm going to hand it over to Robbie because Robbie got nugget tonight. Robbie got it. Got it. Got this going on? No, thank you, sir. Thank you, though. All right, so uh, one of the biggest things that I did when I started riding my motorcycle cycle is I started asking for advice. I started asking other guys that had ridden for a long time, what's the one thing, or can you narrow it down to a couple things, advice that you would give me as I start to ride? That was not the advice I got. <laughs> The advice I did get was, wherever you're looking, you will go. And over and over, it was proven that as I would turn into a corner, if I was afraid as I was going into the corner and I was looking at the curb, I was drifting toward that curb. Okay? But I realized, because I was afraid of the curb, I was being drawn to the curb. Okay? So my fear was self-fulfilling. But if I was able to break my look or my glance away from my fear, I was able to redirect in the right way. There was a king who had a feast. And so he called the people. He called his friend. He said, hey, why don't you come to my feast? I have a banquet. I already got everything already prepared. And one guy said, nah, I just bought some land. Another guy said, nah, 
I was going to say he's going to get married. I think in one other or version, is, I'm going to get married. But here he said, let me just read it. Uh, but the guests had invited, he ignored them and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Well, what if I don't plant my crops? These are good things. You know what I mean? They, they weren't like, hey, I'm ignoring you because I'm deep in sin. Hey, I, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to go shoot up right now. You know? I got to go down to the bar. The guys are waiting on me. You know? I got my girl for the night, and we're going. No, I, I, I got my farm. I got everything at home. If I don't do that, what will happen? I got my business to take care of. If I don't do my business, what will happen? I ain't got time to party. I ain't got time to go to a party with you. I, I got to do these things. Very real things. And see, with, with inside of that, he gave us these blessings so that we can return blessing back onto him. It says, when I wait upon the Lord, it's like a waiter that waits, a waiter that looks across as a waiter that's waiting on a table, and he's looking, he's watching, because as that customer needs something, they come to immediate attention to go, I can get that for you. He never gave us our businesses and our land and all these things so that we're so consumed and we're afraid of losing it that we miss the one that gave it to us. Just be mindful, mindful. That he gave us these things so that we would wait upon him, so that we would look and yearn, just like he waits upon us. That, mm. What are we what are we focused on? Where do we put our focus? Because believe it or not, the business that, we're, that these guys were afraid of losing was the same thing that he could multiply. Who knows? They go to the party and meet another guy that has a business that would connect with their business, and it multiplies. He doesn't call us away for him, to him, for him, so that we can disregard responsibilities. And so that we can refocus and maybe have somebody at the party just waiting for you to connect with them. He does those things, and it multiplies the business. Sometimes we want to do it all ourselves. Says, you gave it to me, i got to take responsibility for it. He goes, no, I got you. If I invite you, I got you. So where's our focus? How are we focusing? Why or what's the motivation of our focus? So as we go into worship, we're not thinking about uh, the guy at home. As we're going into worship, we're not thinking about, man, I had a hard day at work. He's inviting you into the party right now for worship. He's inviting you to come, and you can bring those things to him. Hey, had a really bad day. Hey, I understand. Love on me. And everything in you will be taken care of. Okay? So as we go into worship and we're, and we're being intimate with him, we're being mindful, we're setting our mind on him, and it's just a party. It's, you know what, I'm glad I'm here. Everything else will take care of itself tomorrow because I'm going to trust you. All right? All right. Love you guys. That's what I have. Okay? Okay, let's stand to our feet. If you would like to sow into the ministry, there's a basket up here for either your tithe or your offering. Ooh, Jesus. What are we gazing upon right now? We gaze in upon our day. We gaze in upon our tomorrow. He says, we are not to worry about tomorrow, for today is sufficient. So what he wants right now is the attention on him. Okay? So I ask that we do that. I ask that we truly pay attention to him today. So, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the one that gives us access. So we, in turn, we ask that you come in a mighty way, and we give you complete access into our thoughts, our minds. We just, we give it to you. We give it unto you. So, Lord, we just ask that 
our focus is truly on you, Jesus, because you are the only way. You're the only truth. You're the only life. There's no other. So, Lord, we just are thankful for this time together. We're thankful for our family. Thank you for this house. And we are so thankful for this opportunity to come together this evening. So come, Lord. Come. Amen.
come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. Yes, we come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive. Oh, we come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river.
your name they shall be done oh, unstoppable god let your glory go on and on impossible things in your name they shall be done shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your praise forevermore jesus our god unstoppable nothing shall be impossible your kingdom reigns unstoppable we'll shout your
strings Your love is wild Your love is wild for me It isn't shy It's unashamed Your love is proud To be seen with me To be seen with me You don't give your heart in pieces You don't hide yourself to see Control. One can say your love is a fire burning bright for me. It's not just a spark, it's not just a flame. Your love is a light that all the world will see. I want y'all to uh, really hear this, okay? Really hear this chorus. Because a lot of us as, a, as adults have had to go back and relearn this. Is that he doesn't give himself in pieces. He doesn't hide himself. He doesn't run from you, okay? He's not like parents that are hurt. He's a good, good father. Okay? So I want you to hear it now. And I really want you to sing that. Really think about it. What, what's being sung is that you don't give your heart in pieces. And you don't hide yourself to tease us. Okay? So just, just let that sink in as you're singing the chorus. Okay? It's not 
not the restless kind Your love's not passive It's never disengaged It's always present It hangs on every word you say Love keeps its promises
not fractured It's not a troubled mind It isn't anxious It's not the restless kind Your love's not passive It's never disengaged It's always present on every word you say Love keeps its promises It keeps its word It honors what's sacred Cause its vows are good Your love's not broken It's not insecure Your love's not selfish so pure. Pure. We're gonna sing that again. Here we go. Your love's not fractured. It's not a troubled mind. It isn't anxious. No.
John, I had a, I, I wasn't quite sure what the Lord was trying to show me, so I took it to Pastor James, and I was sharing it with him, and he said, well, I felt something along the same lines with Debbie, so maybe this is something that you're going to do together, because you are one. So I felt the Lord was having me and drawing me to you, um, but I don't, I don't know what this means, but I'm to be obedient okay so i saw you as david when david was running from saul because he knew that he was after him and he ran to the cave and the cave was a, i don't even know if i'm gonna say it right Adullam? is that right Anybody? well he ran to the cave and i i and i was very specific that i had to find out the name of the cave and I, and I felt like, it, and I said, Lord, I said, are you taking him to a place of hiding? Is it, is it a secret place? But this place that he is drawing you to, even though the enemy gets into the cave, he still, you even having the authority to wipe him out because he is made vulnerable to you, you still will not move until the Lord says so. So in that secret place, in that hiding place, that like, the cave actually means the a hiding place. And I was like, okay, I know it doesn't take great scholar there, but it was very specific that he wanted me to make sure that I was specific about going into hiding because sometimes hiding me, hiding doesn't always mean that we're withdrawing because we we're, we've lost. It means that we're smart enough to take comfort in the place that we're supposed to be in. So as you draw near to him and as you draw closer to him and as he pulls you away into that secret place, it's a good place to go, although it may not seem like it is because it's dark, it is withdrawn from everybody, it is not in the public eye, it is truly secret and set apart. So Father, I really don't know the depths of, of even what I'm seeing, but I want to be obedient to you. But Lord, I ask that you just bring a deeper revelation to your son and your daughter. Because Lord, as hard as it is in this life that we live, to get to that secret place with you, because there's a constant pull of affection and attention of those around us. Lord, never let that affection and attention mean more than drawing closer to you. May it never, ever be what comes first in any of our lives. But Lord, as you're drawing him into this place, as you're drawing them into this place, because they are one. They are one. But Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know that with you all things are possible, and with you all things are made, and with you all things are known. So Lord, I just pray for John and Debbie as you draw them back, as you pull them away, the Lord, I just thank you that it's a good work that you are working in and through and around them. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we bless you, Father, with, with 
our hearts wide open, Father, to receive the fullness that you have for us this day, Father. So thank you, Lord, Father. Thank you. We pray that you just continue to bring the abundance of water and nourishment, Father, to our hearts and let that seed grow, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You, y'all get to go back tonight. Y'all, got, y'all don't got much time, though. We ain't going to be out here very long. Y'all better... Just a little bit. Yeah. And one thing that I can add to that word that Lorenda just gave for y'all is I saw the same thing for you, uh, Debbie, but really not much the struggle of being hidden or the, the focus of being hidden. I shouldn't say struggle. The focus of being hidden, but it was the, the, the victory that came, that it was your, your uh, uh, joy for life, your energy, the, everything that y'all are, that you live every day is what helps you overcome the enemy that much faster. So, amen? amen. That's just what I saw. Oh, I guess I need my notes. All right. How's everybody doing? Good week so far? Man, we hadn't even been getting here until 12 o'clock every day. I've, we've been living large. 11 today? Yes. I drink close by. All right, so the other day, uh, Saturday... I had a whole day off. It was amazing. I haven't had one of those in a long time. And uh, it was nice. I got to paint this, my siding, finally, that I've been working on since Thanksgiving. The weather lined up and my day off lined up at the same time. And I got to paint the side of my house. My neighbors, I'm sure they were really nervous because it was... I put up siding and then never did anything to it. So they're like, it was the, my house's red brick with white trim. And then I have yellow hardy board siding on it. It's like, they were probably getting really nervous. But, yes. I got a, a few days off in Thanksgiving, and so I just went out there and I started ripping it down. I didn't realize I wasn't going to get another day off again until uh, April. So. <laughs> yeah, Josh, Josh helped me put it up, too. So it was nice. But I also was out there, and uh, my daughter and my son-in-law live right in the house right next door to us so it's really awesome um they spend all their time at our house really but they pay rent at the other place and uh but i love them to death but they're learning how to function in their own house which is cool because i'm right here right next door to help them when they need it dad come fix this you know i need this done will you help me figure that you know all those things yeah washer and dryer i need your stove i need your Yes, all those things. <laughs> yeah. no, you don't really understand. They're over there at least six days out of the week. Maybe one to eat a pizza from Titino's or something like that. But, but anyways, as I was over there, uh, they have a rock yard in this, this house. And it was uh, uh, not very well taken care of by the previous owners. So the, this time of year, all the weeds are springing up. And it's got those little cactus that can grow like 12 inches in one night, you know. It's like, how do these things come up? But I was out there and I was spraying these the other day. And uh, I was really wondering how inconvenient weeds really are. They never grow at very good times. They never grow at very good places. And it started thinking about this word that I've, I gave this a few years ago. Um, and it's about the root of bitterness. And... Uh, I don't know why. I really, I, I, while I was doing all this housework, it's, of course it's time to really just not think about anything else, but just it. And all of a sudden, boy, I got overcome with just a heaviness and realized Lord was really just pressing on me and, and working on my heart. And I went over to Lorinda and said, you can believe what God's just telling me. And she was like, oh, no. And she just started breaking down because God was really working on her at the same time. Uh, we've been through a lot, you know, this last few months not necessarily here but 
you, you y'all are kind of privy to some information. We're really trying to hold Temple together a little bit too. That we're we're pastors over there. We developed a lot of friendships, a lot of relationships over there. So we're connected with that people, and you can't just leave them. We have, still have to take care of them, and we still stay in contact with them. We will go to their kids' games, and and as much as we're trying to develop that same stuff here, we're slowly bringing ourselves over here. In that. Whenever our brothers and sisters go through struggles over there, we go through struggles with them. You know, that's just how it is. And it's been tough. It's been really tough in Temple and been hurt by a few people. In that, I've realized that I have developed some wounds. You know, and, and of course, you can't just cut down a weed. I mow them all the time, and that's within a day, they're right back up again. So I really was, as I was spraying these, these with Roundup, and I don't, I get the concentrate bottle of Roundup, and I pour the whole bottle. One, supposed to make like 60 gallons. Like I ain't playing with no weeds, you know. I'm going to get them, get them once, and it's going to last all year. So I kind of attack this, this same principle towards, uh, towards this, this thing that's going on in my heart. And I, I want to just kind of get a scenario here of, of what I'm talking about. And this is from 2 Samuel, a perfect example of what I'm talking about. 2 Samuel um, 13. Um, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 14, 25 through 26 is about David's children, Absalom. And in that, he said that he was praised as the most handsome man in all of Israel. See, I could relate with this guy. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I know, I'm just playing. But that's why I put that up, honey. Yes, <laughs> yes, flawless from head to toe. He cut his hair only once a year, which I got my hair cut the other day, and it was, I was doing the gray hair. It was terrible. I was like, I got, anyways. But it, he was obviously a very well-blessed man. He was a very good-looking man. And, uh, you know, I started thinking about that, that, you know, if being handsome and being blessed and being rich was the, the deal, then I wouldn't have anybody to minister to right now, right? Because y'all blessed and good looking people too, right? Yeah, but we're, that's not the secret to success at all. Um, and then neither was it for him either. You know, he had a he had some issues and, and he's a perfect example of somebody who allowed bitterness to take over and control his life. And I'll read from uh, verses, uh, from chapter 13, verse 20 through 23. It says, uh, I'll go a little backstory. Um, he had his brother Amnon and his sister Tamar, and Amnon really had a desire for his sister to the point to where he tricked her and ultimately raped her and defiled her and shamed her. And as soon as he had done that, he, he wanted something so bad, he said, I couldn't think about anything else, but as soon as he did it, he realized it, he was overcome with disgust. And it says as much as he loved her, he then rejected her, and then he sent her out. And he and it really just shamed her and disgusted her. And, and, and her brother, Absalom, found out about this, and that's kind of where we pick it up right here. He asked her, said, is this true that Amnon had been with you? He says, well, my sister, keep quiet for now. Since he is your brother, don't you worry about it. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. When the king David heard what happened, he was very upset, very furious. Um, perfect example of what I'm talking about because Amnon took on, I mean, Am, Amnon did a great offense to his family. And, and Lorinda ministered about this six months ago probably kind of when we first came over here it was a kind of similar subject but I really wanted to focus on on the the bitterness of what happened with Absalom because Absalom took on the brother's offense I mean the sister's offense and towards the brother and it really he said it, it he went to go dwell with Absalom that she dwelt with Absalom and in that it's kind of like two people together that were have been hurt and they were constantly feeding each other. And they, they, were, they were constantly living together. And said she lived there and she was barren. I mean, she wasn't producing that she was dry. So obviously this is, a, this is 
something that really affected her in such a way that it lasted for two years. It says that um, two years later, when Absalom's sheep were being sheared at Ben-Hazar near Ephraim, Absalom invited uh, the king's son to come feast. So they dwelt there for two years together. That's a long time for something to take a really good root. Can you imagine not mowing your backyard for two years? What would it look like? What about this bitterness that can overcome our hearts? And if it's not taken care of, if those weeds aren't plucked out for two years. And he did. He got to the point to where he was so bitter and so angry that he not just wanted to get his brother back, but he wanted to kill him. And he did. He ultimately took his life. He had people jump him. He set it all up. And, and I'm really not trying to focus on Absalom. It's not the heart of my story. Part of my story is how do we deal with things when stuff happens? Because stuff going to happen, right? You know, I, I, even with me. I mean, I, I'm in here. You think I'm living the dream life. I get to be around kids all day long. I get 24 hours a day with my wife. <laughs> I'm saying I'm blessed. I'm just saying I'm I get to spend. And, and you know, I'm, I'm doing ministry. One thing that I really wanted to do all the day. But in that, some of the biggest heartbreaks have come in this position. You know, and I was like, how do you choose to deal with these things? So Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15 say this. It says, pursue peace with all people and holiness. Because peace and holiness, they're not together. With, uh, without, there is, no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this many will be defiled. So the root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And I took a picture of the, the words. Let me pull them up. We were just singing it just a minute ago. It says, Break open prison doors, set all the captives free, spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well in me. And I started thinking about that. I said, how much does that contradict my word? Because I'm talking about a root of bitterness that springs up out of us. Because, or we cultivate ourselves properly and take care of what we're supposed to be doing, that it's a well. It's an everlasting well that comes out of us. But it could be one or the other. And, and the Bible's very clear that you can't have both. No. And so the kind of story where I'm stuck at, you know, and I'm not immune to this stuff. But it says, fall short of the grace of God. And I guess you have to kind of find the definition for the grace of God for that. So what is, what is grace? What's a good definition for grace? Undeserved favor. I kind of looked at it as, as uh, God's empowerment to live and get the Zoe life. God's, God's empowering life, which is exactly it. Unmerited favor. Um, but we've all been hurt before and un unfortunately I've been on the offensive end of that too and I've hurt a lot of people um, if I can't think of all my hurts without thinking of how many times I've hurt people intentionally and unintentionally and sometimes uh, not only do we get hurt but sometimes we can even imagine that we're hurt and never, never receive a wound I, think I thought of this the other day. There's a lot of times that we, uh, I think me and James had a conversation one day, that we can work up a good argument going up in our heads and not even meet the person yet. One day it's like, man, how does that happen? But it's because there's a root inside of us. There's a root going on, and it doesn't take much for that sucker to start wanting to break the ground and pop up. And, and, and we wanted to, before we even talk to that person, we've already got our arguments and our defenses and we've got every scenario played out. If they say this, this is what I'm going to do. And I was like, oh, that's so me. I've got to stop this. So I say all that. It says that uh, we can be very intense with, with stuff that we're going to do, what we're going to say, what's going to happen. My wife can even get very upset that she goes out shopping and she spends a lot of money. And she comes home, instead of being happy, hey, look what I bought. She's like, well, don't even pay attention to what I did. She's already got the argument in her head. That she spent too much money, I'm going to be mad about it. Yep. But that's not always the case, is it? 
I just don't let you go shopping. So how does this start and why does it start? So most of the time it starts because there's a bit of truth in everything that we have a, 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 an issue with. You know, it's never maybe the full truth, but it has a lot of truth in it. And therefore, we can build the rest of that up, you know, on our own. I said the number, number one list of types of pains that I'm talking about, though, number one has to be betrayal. It's the hardest one to deal with if in your relationship with your husband or wife or have your kids turn against you or a friend that gossips about you. The list can go on of what bitter, bitterness can come up from betrayal. Uh, a mother, a father, a son, daughter, I guess it doesn't matter. Betrayal is always most painful when it's somebody that's close to us. It never hurts when it's somebody that's not close to you because they're not close to you. But it can't hurt you. But it's usually the closest people that want us to talk about you and have something happen like that. Either by a cheating spouse, uh, an addiction by, from a child, or the overflowing mouth of a friend. And now we have social media to add to the mix. And now we get to read what others say. And we get to add their own, our own tone. We get to add our own emotions to it. And we can build a good argument off of something that's never really happened or read into it a little bit more. So bitterness even has more of an ability to get a root in us now more than it did 10 years ago. Um, number two is abuse. Sexual abuse. Mental or physical abuse. Theft, robbery, death. All these things can leave emotional wounds in us. It could even be chastisement of the Lord and nobody likes that. But... I had somebody just tell me the other day, a phone call saying, I am very, very, very mad at God right now. And it didn't go very well. Like, it's not God's fault. But sometimes we can't see that God's, what he's doing. I'll, I'll put the scripture up here, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 9. Uh, Hebrews 12 is, I'm going to sum it up in a little bit. But it says, have you forgotten that all the encouraging words God spoke to you as your, in your children? He said, my children... Don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one of, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, nobody looks at it as divine, do we? No, it does say that. This divine discipline. Um, lost my place. I'll go, to, I'll go to A. It says, if God doesn't discipline you at all, uh, he does all, all of his children. It means that you are a, a legitimate child and not our illegitimate child and not really his child at all. Since we respect our earthly fathers who disciplines us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits who live in us forever? forever? And that's why we're here, because he was working on me in the front yard. I'm spraying the weeds. And he's like, you know what, James, you got this issue. And I am such a cool pastor. I share my pain and misery with all of y'all. I am so nice. I don't go through this alone. I'm, I'm walking with you. I'm not ahead of you. I'm beside you. And we're locking arms. We're going to do this. <laughs> if it works. All right. So whatever the case is, we have to deal with our hurt and our pain from things that happen to us. And sometimes the guilt of what we do to other people. Um, seeking forgiveness for ourselves and others that we've wronged in our lives. But let's look at this definition of what bitterness is. Okay? Bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly and resentment. And I read this the other day and I was like, uh, somebody posted it said, Bitterness is unfulfilled revenge. And I think that was the beginning of my process. Unfulfilled revenge, meaning that you want to get back at somebody and you just hadn't got a good chance to do it yet. But I'm waiting. <laughs> no, I'm not. Now, that's, why, that's the part he was trying to work out of me. It says, Ephesians 4, verse 31, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. Boy, that's a paragraph right there, isn't it? That's a sentence, I mean. Bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. They all group together as one. 
practices as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, uh, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Why? Why do we got to put it away? Why did Why did He say get rid of it? It's poison. It really is. I'm gonna break it down for you. I just flipped my note and I didn't have to. One of my sermons are so short. I come up with ten pages and only read five of them. Uh, here's a Here's the word. Uh, can you pull up? Um, in the concordance, it's Greek 4088. Erika. And it's, this is the, the, the root word of bitterness. And it goes extreme wickedness, a bitter root, and so producing a bitter fruit, uh, bitterness, and bitter hatred. Now, I broke this down a little bit more, which is um, the word acra. I guess it's not in there on this version, but there was another word. It's called A-C-R-I-D, acrid. Um, and it basically means the sharp or biting to the taste or smell, bitterly pungent, irritating to the nose, or also known as extreme or sharply stinging or bitter. Okay, So it's just an acidic type word, the base of that. But it talks about how nasty it is, and, and you, it almost referenced burning rubber. It's something that you really can't stand. This is the root word of that bitterness. But also it says extremely caustic. And when you break down the word caustic, it means able to burn or corrode organic tissue by a chemical reaction. Caustic is something that slowly destroys something in a very slow process by a chemical reaction, kind of like rust perfect example of rust. It, it, it slowly breaks that thing down where it doesn't have any function. And God's saying, well, you can't have that in your life because it's slowly, very slowly, very gently tearing you apart. And it says, get rid of it. You don't have a place for it. It says to crow it away slowly over time to a complete uselessness. So how do we deal with these issues of how we deal with hurt and pain from things that have happened to us are very important and how we help other people get over things that have happened to them. It's not something just to, well, oh, yeah, you get over it. Time takes care of itself. Ah, that's not always true because old boy sat on this thing for two years and it built itself up to such a point that he didn't just want to, to punch his brother in the nose. He wanted to kill him. He had built up so much frustration, so much anger inside of him that it's, it's, it killed him ultimately. So that bitterness can stop our spiritual growth and put us or chain us to a situation. And it really kind of reminds me of a scenario that I talked about with unforgiveness. And they're kind of similar to the same thing, but bitterness is just a little bit different because bitterness, you don't know it's there until you hit it. Unforgiveness is, you kind of know when you're upset with somebody because you constantly think about it. Um, the other day, Lorinda called me downstairs, and I made it about two-thirds of the way down, and I stopped, oh, my phone, and I checked it. So, oh, okay. And I go to take off thinking that I was at the bottom of the stairs. And I had about three or four more stairs left. <laughs> But the whole, the whole point was, is I, I fell. She laughed so hard because I hit that dang door was open, and I, boom, I ran into the door. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I just hurt my knee a little bit, and I hurt my, my wrist because I caught that little ball on the top. I was trying to catch myself. Nothing was there. So you could see just a little bit of bruise. But all the time I'd sit down in her office several days later, I'd be rubbing, scratching my knee or something. I'd be like, oh, I just hit that spot. And I'd touch my wrist if I was sitting there and I was rubbing. I'd like, oh, that's there. I didn't know that was there. I forgot that I had a pain. I forgot that I had a wound. I for, you know, time until I hit it. And when I hit it, I was really reminded, oh, James just had a big fall. Some of us are here bound up in bitterness, and we hold hostage uh, 
we are held hostage to the actions of another person. And it's slowly killing us. We are never meant to stay there, but to grow and learn from our past. Because I know most of you don't have that problem. But some of us do. And it says, Psalms 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see that there is any wicked ways in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Hurt is the seeds of bitterness. The actions that come next are its fruits. You know, the heart is mentioned in the Bible over 900 times. I say that because I think God really cares. Because when it says that thing's going to spring up, where do you think it springs up from? It springs up from right here. So he's very interested about what's going on in our hearts. And Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says this. It said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to to the fruit of his doing. Fruit of his what? His actions. So whenever I say we have to get this root of bitterness under check, it's not important because we might harm the other person. That's true, yes. But we're slowly killing ourselves too, and God's going to hold us accountable by what we say, what we do, our fruits of our actions. That hurts. Bad things are going to happen to us. So how we respond means everything to God. You know, most of us tend to internalize our pain and hurt. But just like my issues with falling down the stairs, when it gets touched, you know it's there. In uh, 2 Samuel verse 13, 20 through 22, her brother Absalom saw her and asked, Is it true? I've already touched that scripture. Um... But what happened was when King David heard what had happened, he was very angry. And although Absalom never spoke to Amnon about this, he hated Amnon deeply because of what he had done to his sister. Why would he tell his sister to hold her peace? What's the reason for that? Because he knew. He, deep down inside, he knew. I said, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to get him. And set forth the planting of that seed, that root of that bitterness. David's actions or lack of actions set this whole thing in in motion. But Absalom is the one that's going to reap that harvest. So how we deal with bitterness is a big deal. Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15, I read it before, it says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and you, and by this many become defiled. You know, there are two words that I want you to notice here. One is come up suddenly, springing up and causing trouble. Those are important words. The roots are often hidden underground, hidden from sight, just like the wound on my arm, the one on my knee. They caused great pain when I touched them. You know, these. Uh, I, th- I thought of this the other day. Whenever they had the World War II, and I think Vietnam War, they had these uh, mines that they would plant in the ground. And they weren't, you ever wonder why they'd use mines? They're not big explosions. It's meant just to wipe out hundreds of people. That's pointless. What they wanted to do was they wanted to step on these just enough to take off a foot or maybe a couple toes or make that person completely immobile because then it takes up twice as many resources because now you got to take out the man that got hurt but not very much damage, not much uh, uh, expense and a couple people now got to carry them then they got to have another doctor to take care of that man and they weren't satisfied with that they made these other uh, claymore these, not claymore but these mines where you stepped on them they're called bouncing betties and if you let off of it, then they would pop up about three or four feet in the air, and then they'd just get a whole bunch of people right about waist level, called the bouncing betties. The whole point was to inflict large amounts of 
uh, of minor pain and, and difficulties, and it hurt a whole bunch of people. Do you think the enemy has any hands in him stirring the pot and get you all frustrated and get you all mad and get you all wounded and hurt and, and, and get you thinking about, do you think Facebook really came from God? Huh? He's, man, he's using that right now to stir up so much frustration between families. Yeah, you can share photographs. The devil came to Eve as a, and said, the fruit, look at the fruit. You can be just like God. He presented something that was good. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? The purpose to cause great wounds is without killing, using up as many resources as possible, for preventing as many soldiers from entering the combat as possible, ultimately stalling the advancement of those who can do damage to the enemy. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble by this, many become defiled. To become defiled, to become dirty, become contaminated how do we defile others what's it I, I, I kind of re- think about this is, is you ever give a two-year-old you would know give a two-year-old a big giant lollipop and give him about 20 minutes in a room by himself that's defiled right there because that lollipop gonna be all over him be all over his hands, it can be all over everything that he touched. And when you pick him up and try to clean him up, you're going to get it all over you. You're going to get it all over the sink. You're going to get it all over everything he touched. And it probably got onto his brothers and sisters. And it's everywhere around that defilement, that, that bitterness inside of us. Whenever we, whenever we take on an offense, we take on a hurt, since many are going to be defiled. Why? Because we're going to talk about it. And we're going to say, well, you, you know, I know I went to a church and that pastor hurt me. And that's why I ain't never going to go back to a church again. And you just tell the same story over and over and over again. Before you know it, you got a hundred people out there that just don't want to go to church anymore. I ain't gonna to go to no church. There's a bunch of hypocrites there. You defiled many people because you had a root of bitterness inside of you. A two year old puts a lollipop. It gets everywhere, it gets on everything. It's everything you touch. Alan, can you play that video? I had this play. This is uh, this is off of Joseph Prince uh, a sermon, off the same subject. I was playing around when I was coming to work this morning, and I saw this. And it's a little piece of gold, and it, it got dumped in the mud. Something bad happened to the gold. It got put in something that he didn't need. And he said, "Well, how how are we going to clean this thing up?" He says, "Well, you wash it with the word." You wash it with water. So the gold never lost its value. And sometimes we go through situations that doesn't change our value. It doesn't change that we're the king's kids. Yes, bad things happen to us, but we got to get cleaned back up again. We got to get put back in a position where we're not defiling others, that we're not being a mess. He says, to become defiled is just like this gold bar. It never lost its value. It just needed washing. We often need washing also. Do we ask God to search our hearts and to point out things that we can work on? He'll show them to you. I still have many, a lot. I have a lot of issues still. I have a lot of hurts and pains that I'm working through. But it's not my denial of having these issues. It's my process of working through them. I can't stand here and say I've got it all together that's not true. Truth is, I'm jacked up, and I'm doing this with you. This is Hebrews 12, verse 16. He also made this comment when he played this video. It says that there's, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 16, it says, Lest there be any fornicators or profane person like Esau, who is one morsel of food, sold his birthright. He said that they're all tied together. The ones where I just talked about where the root of bitterness springs up, just pursue all peace with all people, holiness without it. No one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root or bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by it many become defiled. And then it goes to 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who sold 
who was one morsel of food sold his birthright. The word lest connects all those verses together. It connects the whole process of what we're trying to do. It says lest one fall short of the target. Lest one gets into the root of bitterness. Lest then it goes into fornicators. What's fornicators? Somebody that has a, a, a sex outside of covenant relationship. What's that got to do with bitterness at all? Well, if you look into the root word, pornea, which is the root word of porn. It's not always about sex, but yeah, most people who act out in, in sexual promiscuous ways do have a wound, do have an issue with bitterness. But that's not what I'm talking about. It's the, it's the, the outside the covenant portion that I want to talk about. If you break this down a little bit more, it's a, the Greek word, that word pornea breaks down to this. And I'm just going to touch on the last part. It says, uh, uh, contracted from, to traverse from the base of, then there's this word, to traffic by traveling. That is, dis dispose of as merchandise or into slavery said you'll get put into bondage by just traversing off the mark just a little bit, by getting off of the base of what we're trying to talk about, which was a wound or a hurt. All of a sudden, you traverse just a little bit, and you're going just a little bit off, and you're missing the whole goal of what God has for you, that Zoe life, by just traversing a little bit. Oh, the key word traverse there, I know it's not speaking of it, but it says something free in me right there because all the things that I've ever accomplished, I mean not accomplished but, but went through in my life is because there was a little bit of truth to it and I took that and I made it in something that was just a little bit off of what God had for me I let bitterness take control and I, my mouth speaks before I have time to think and, and respond the way God wants me to respond you know so those together Pornia Pornicus is to miss the mark. But if you sum up Hebrews 12, it's saying this. And you, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm in my own James Payne language right here. But if you take all of it and you read it together, it says this. It says, grab your brothers and sisters who are weak, and let's do this together. Yes, we're going to hit obstacles. Yes, we have to be really careful, but it's the hidden things that can trip us up. The enemy we can see, there's the stuff inside of us that's always going to get us. It says, when we find them, let's not defile others, but let's go through each other's hurts together to heal each other. Sure, there are things that can loom over us like a great mountain, and I wish I, had, I could read the whole scripture to you, but he says, it, and it sums it up after like uh, verse 20 right in there. It says, yes, this is a, it, it seems like a giant mountain. You're going to come across these things. You're going to seem like a giant mountain. But this ain't the same mountain that you, you've been to before. He said, this mountain's different. This ain't the same mountain that made Moses tremble. This ain't the same mountain that, that induced fear. He said, this is a mountain where God's glory dwells on. This is a whole completely different mountain. There's two mountains. This ain't your old mountain that you used to be. You're in this with a bunch of good people. And we can overcome all these things as they spring up. Yes. And I might even cause them. But when they come up, we work together to get over them. Because God's going to be at the center of it. I'm going to read this, the mountains part right here. It says, Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 24. It says, unlike your ancestors, you didn't come to Mount Sinai. All that volcanic blaze. This is in the message version. Uh, volcanic blaze and earth-shaking rumble to hear God speak that earth uh, ear-splitting word and soul-shaking message terrified them and they begged him to stop when the when they heard the words if an animal touches the mountain uh, it's as good as dead they were afraid to move even Moses was terrified no that's not your mountain that's not your mountain it says that not the your experience at all You've come to Mount Zion. The city of the living God resides. The invisible Jerusalem is populated by throngs of festive angels and Christian citizens. It is the city where God is the judge 
with judgments that make us just. You come to Jesus who presents you with a new covenant and a fresh character from God. He is the mediator to this covenant. The murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's, a homicide that cried for vengeance, became a proclamation from grace. Amen. That's for us. We're not, yes, these things pop up. Yes, they'll loom up like mountains, but this ain't your same mountain. This ain't this, you're not in the same place where you had to worry about doing it by yourself. You're amongst believers in this house. And as these things rise up, let's take them on together. Let's, it, it says we got Jesus on our side. We got a mediator that's here to, to make everything right as long as we take on these issues and not put them behind us or hide them and cover them up because you all know that guy that don't open up his backyard to nobody. Got a bunch of weeds. Y'all know. Y'all know that guy. You can see the grass over the top of the fence. I say that lightly, but really, that's the heart of my message, is I really want you to know that you are in good company and that we can do this together. It's not an insurmountable obstacle that we're going to face, but it's something that together we can take on all roots of bitterness. Amen? Amen. Y'all be blessed.